It took Mercedes 55 years after the presentation of the 300 SL to give to the world another serious production gullwing. Half a decade where they discussed, experimented, designed, showed a couple of gullwing concept cars but never really dared to bring one to the streets. And then finally, in late 2009, came the SLS. They honestly did their best to build up a decade-long tension. What it also shows you is the great respect and honestly, a bit of fear they had. You don't mess up the success of the Gullwing. You just don't. So the SLS was a massively important project and a fascinating chapter of Mercedes history. So let's dig into it. Let's start with a brief history lesson. It's crucial to understand where the SLS came from. And of course, you all know the roots. The 300 SL Gullwing, the most precious car in Mercedes history in terms of importance and significance for the brand. The race car, W194, was introduced in 1952. Won everything. The 24 Hours of Le Mans, the Bern Grand Prix, Nürburgring, Carrera Panamericana, just everything. Well, except for the Mille Miglia. They finished second, four minutes behind a Ferrari. But yeah, it was hugely successful. An insane car, just seven years after the war. It was the greatest sports car of the time. And then two years later, Mercedes introduced a road version of it. It was presented in New York in 1954 and would become the greatest legend that Mercedes has ever built, till this day. Certainly one of the most admired and loved cars in automotive history, no matter which brand, no matter which era. There's just nothing comparable. This is the sports car of the century, and it was fascinating in so many aspects. The styling and proportions, the technology with its tubeless steel frame and the direct injection engine. But certainly this car wouldn't have this place in history without its gullwing doors. They are such an iconic element. Every child knows them, and they instantly turned the 300 SL into the dream car worldwide. So high stakes for everything that followed not only from the competition, but also from Mercedes-Benz itself. They didn't dare to touch the Gullwing story for a very long time. In 1969, they came back with this orange C111, a fascinating experimental car. But sadly, it never made it to production for various reasons. Then, another 22 years later, a similar story with the C112, a very charming V12 rear mid-engine sports car, inspired by the glorious Group C race cars of that time. Same story. Exciting car, gullwing doors, excited customers, willing to pay. Mercedes said no, it remains a concept. That was the second chance missed. And there's a third little gullwing episode within that 55-year void. It's this. The Unicorn CLK LM Street version. A one-off homologation special based on the 1998 race car that famously won the FIA GT Championship. This is one of my all-time dream cars. But certainly, with its concept and its production numbers, one. It's something very, very different and not in the line of a 300 SL successor. It's just a whole different category, so that one doesn't really count either. So now, we're in the early 2000s, the launch of the 300 SL lies almost half a decade behind us, and it's still the only Mercedes Gullwing you could buy. Time to do something about it. The idea for a new Mercedes supercar was obviously nothing new. It was something certain people within the company always had in mind and were pushing for. With all the sports and race car heritage, this was naturally at the core and heart of the brand. But the concrete idea for the SLS was actually born within AMG. In 2005, they had intense discussions about their future strategy as the performance branch of Mercedes-Benz. Should they continue to turn existing Mercedes-Benz cars into more dynamic performance vehicles? Or should they be able to evolve into something much more independent by not only creating own engines and chassis, but even complete vehicles developed by AMG in the Falterbach? To put it simply, do they want to be more like BMW M or Porsche? And you all know what the result of these secret soul-searching sessions was. Go big. And what would be bigger than creating a brand new Mercedes supercar, maybe even a Gullwing, designed and developed completely in-house at AMG? And that's exactly what they decided for back in 2005. To convince the Daimler board of that idea, they would put together a first rough concept within the next months, starting from scratch. The clear target was a two-seater supercar, 
Er sollte ein kompromissloser Supersportwagen werden. This shouldn't be just some extreme version of an SL, but something groundbreakingly new and much more radical. To be able to compete with the very best cars in that segment. The very early concepts were actually designed in collaboration with Chrysler and Dodge. The idea was to develop a common platform for three vehicles. Firstly, the next generation Dodge Viper. Secondly, a new Chrysler supercar in the vein of the 2005 concept car Chrysler Firepower. And last but not least, the new Mercedes Gullwing supercar. But these plans quickly came to an end when Chrysler was more and more in financial trouble, what ultimately led to the split between Daimler and Chrysler in 2007. So now Mercedes could focus to 100% on their own supercar. The basic shape and proportions had to create a strong link to the 1950s Gullwing Coupe. This was obviously not possible with some mid-engine concept as more and more other supercars were applying at that time. For instance, Audi with their R8. It just wouldn't fit the Mercedes DNA. For the future Gullwing, the engine had to be in the front. And to reach the target level in terms of driving dynamics, it had to be set as low and back as possible, ending up completely behind the front axle. This front mid-engine layout already defined a lot how the silhouette of this car was going to look like, with its insanely long front hood and the compact greenhouse sitting almost above the rear axle. At that point, the design team at Mercedes in Sindelfingen came into play and received the first rough dimensions and concept drawings to develop their vision of a future Mercedes supercar. An intense two-week sketching phase began, where all the studios and designers competed with each other in trying to create the most convincing vision and shape. The six most promising ideas were selected and transformed into 3D scale models. Of these six, a clear winner emerged, and it was the Mark Featherston design. Within the design team, led by chief designer Peter Pfeiffer, Mark Featherston was a 29-year-old Scottish exterior designer who joined Mercedes in 1999. His design sketch was of striking purity, inspired a lot by aviation themes, and it immediately convinced everybody around. So it was refined in all the little detail areas over the next months and transferred into a full-scale model. Besides all the technical studies on the layout and platform of the new supercar, this stunning design model was all AMG needed to convince Daimler to move forward with this project. In December 2006, it got officially approved by the executive board. Project 197, as it was internally called, had the clearance for takeoff. Two thousand and seven started with a search for adequate mule cars to run first test drives for the vehicle of similar package and dimensions. This was still within the Daimler Chrysler era, and luckily their US partners had just what they needed: a long hood, big engine sports car built on a perfectly adaptable chassis where they could integrate all the AMG components for testing. So they ordered first one and later another thirteen Viper SRT ten models from Chrysler and turned them into the first mule cars. These early prototypes were the first signs visible to the outside world that Mercedes was working on something very special. Over the year, they were spotted several times in the Death Valley, on the Nürburgring and in other places around the world, and they instantly excited journalists and fans. During that phase, the basic technical concept was defined. An aluminium space frame chassis, a modified version of the M156 V8 engine front mid mounted in the car, and a transaxle layout with a gearbox in the back for excellent weight balance. We'll have a much deeper look at all the tech in Chapter 5. With all the experiences and evolutions made with these Viper mules, AMG already had a high level of maturity when entering the next phase of development. That included a lot of simulation and virtual engineering, but also a new set of beautiful prototypes. These were sent into the world starting in August 2008. It was a growing fleet of ultimately somewhere around 40 cars, they all had the target design for the aluminium space frame, a near production body and the modified V8 engine. Destinations of the testing program were the usual suspects. Death Valley, California for temperature stress tests, altitude testing at Pikes Peak, Arjeplog in Sweden for low grip winter testing, South Africa for endurance runs, a Nürburgring to fine tune chassis and suspension and optimize handling and driving dynamics on a racetrack. On top came various proving grounds and test facilities like the Mercedes wind tunnel in Sindelfingen, or dynamic test rigs for chassis and durability approval. By mid-summer of 2009, the fleet entered its final testing phase to ensure the maturity in every little detail before going into production. Which, by the way, would take place in Sindelfingen on a specific line with a lot of manual processes, just like with the 300SL half a decade earlier. 
The next big milestone was the world premiere at the Frankfurt Motor Show. In September 2009, Mercedes unveiled the final series production model of the SLS AMG Coupe, the C197. And just as a short side note, I think it's surprising that Mercedes has not presented any SLS concept or show car a couple of years ahead of the production car. I mean, they present show cars at virtually everything. The reason was maybe simply time or budget. It might as well have been due to the 2008 economic crisis and the fact that the supercar was just the wrong message at the wrong time. Or they didn't want to hurt the SLR, which was still on sale and already suffering from poor demand. There's many possible reasons, but it's certainly unusual for such a dream car, and I was always wondering why. Well, however, that's what it was. We got the final thing right away. And as a consequence, the sensation of this reveal was even bigger. The world premiere took place on September 15, 2009. And no doubt about it, this new Galwing supercar was the star of that year's auto show, and arguably of the whole year. Lewis Hamilton, back then still a one-time world champion, drove the car on stage. What the public finally got to see, three years after the first design models, was a car of stunning proportions and striking beauty, which resembled very much the first key sketch from 2006. Normally, from the very first sketch to the final product, things change a lot. Not in this case. The very early sketches from Mark Featherston were so pure and intense, they just prevailed. The silhouette of the car was so powerful, it didn't need any further gimmicks or special effects to be exciting. Nor did it need any explanation. At first glance, this was a serious supercar. Wow. The design was sensual purity at its best. There's nothing overly complicated, nothing trendy or retro. It's a clean and pure and simple sculpture, which makes the car absolutely timeless. The icing on the cake, of course, were these doors. This was such a strong statement and clearly evidence for the confidence of Mercedes to introduce a car which creates this obvious and direct link to the greatest car of their history. Sales began shortly after the IAA in November 2009, with prices starting at 177,000 euros in Germany. Let's have a closer look at what exactly you got for all that money. Let's start with the engine. It's based on the famous 6.2 litre V8 called M156, which was introduced in 2006 and available in almost every model from Mercedes. C, E, S class, CLK, CLS, SL, CL, everything. You could even get an R63, which by the way is a very, very rare car. That's a different story. This M156 was the first engine that has been developed completely by AMG alone. It's not based on an existing Mercedes engine. And I think it's fair to say that this engine defined the character and soul of AMG as we know it today, more than anything else. This mighty V8 is naturally aspirated and probably one of the best sounding V8s ever. It's loud, but in a tasteful way, extremely charismatic and truly enjoyable. It's just a legend. And why is it called 63, although it's 6.2 liters? It's absolutely clear for us. Well, that's pure marketing. The 6.3 is a big badge of AMG history. The glorious red pig, which out of nowhere won its class at the Spa 24 hour race in 1971 and made AMG famous overnight. That car was based on a 300 SEL 6.3. And that's where it came from. That's why all the cars with the M156 are called 63. So AMG took that engine for the SLS, but with significant updates in many areas. The major change was the switch to a dry sump lubrication to lower the center of gravity and enable faster cornering speeds. The air intakes were optimized with the two air filters separated from the engine and mounted on the chassis. Internally, it had new forged pistons compared to the cast ones on the M156. A weight optimized crankcase and new camshafts. All these upgrades made the engine lighter and more inclined to handle fast cornering speeds and turned it into the most powerful naturally aspirated production series V8 in the world. It is a dream come true. And all that justified a new name, M159. It's built in a Falterbach, one man, one engine, as always at AMG, and then brought to the vehicle plant in Sindelfingen. So this engine, weighing 206 kilos, is installed completely behind the front axle. The whole cabin and firewall and moved far from the axle to provide that space. 
a very different layer than any other standard Mercedes. And the next singularity comes right behind the engine, where in your standard Mercedes, the gearbox is directly connected to the engine. On the SLS, it's on the rear axle. This brings weight to the rear of the car and leads to a rear biased weight distribution of 47 to 53, which is excellent for a front engine car. Compare this to an SL65 Black Series, there it was more or less the other way around. So this transaxle layout is key for the SLS driving dynamics. Great traction, well-balanced handling, stability under hard braking and so on. The gearbox is a 7-speed dual-clutch transmission from the German supplier Getruck. You find the same box on a few Ferraris, for instance 458, FF, F12 and others. AMG calls it the Speed Shift DCT. A mechanical locking differential is integrated in the gearbox housing and comes as standard on all SLS variants. So now we have the engine on the front, the gearbox in the rear and obviously need something to connect these two and that is done by the torque tube. It's a 25 kilogram aluminium casting which is bolted to engine and gearbox and creates a rigid mechanical connection. And inside is a lightweight carbon fiber shaft that rotates at engine speed and transmits all the torque from the engine to the gearbox. The whole unit of engine connecting torque tube and gearbox is mounted within the chassis on four points, creating a high stiffness integration of the powertrain into the chassis. The only thing which is really a bit of a pain with this transax layout, there's not really a cool all wheel drive solution. And that's why you haven't seen that neither on the SLS nor on the successor GT. I mean, it's feasible, you can look at the Nissan GTR, but it's certainly getting a bit awkward. So the SLS remained purely rear wheel drive for its entire life cycle, except for the electric drive SLS, but we'll get there in a minute. A quick look at the body in white first, which is also a very special design, not at all the traditional Mercedes way. It's a space frame structure that consists mainly of aluminium profiles, all the blue parts in this picture, joined by some aluminium castings in connecting areas like A-post, suspension attachment on front and rear, and also the longitudinal and the roof where the gullwing doors are being attached to. The rest is sheet metal, again all lightweight aluminium, only in the A-pillar there's a bit of steel integrated to ensure crash safety in case of a rollover. In total the body is 241 kilos. This is without any exterior panels or side doors. Speaking of which, let's have a closer look at these doors for another minute. In case of a severe crash ending in a scenario where the car is upside down on its roof, the door hinges have a special party trick up their sleeves. Little explosive pills are integrated in the hinges that are fired by the crash management system a few seconds after the incident and allow the passengers or a rescue team to just pull away the doors from the cabin and get out of the car. So you see that AMG has put a lot of effort into these doors to be able to continue this famous gullwing story. And of course you can always argue whether this concept actually makes sense on a super sports car. Do they serve a specific purpose or is it basically just a design gimmick in a nod to Mercedes heritage? You probably know the story of the gullwing doors on the 1954 SL. This was actually the only door concept that worked in combination with the steel frame and the high door sills. Ultimately, this whole concept on the original gullwing saved weight and increased the rigidity of the body. So the decision was a pure technical one. And no matter what marketing told us, that's not the case with the SLS. And yet, it's to 100% the right decision to implement these doors on that car. They might add a couple of kilos in critical areas of the car, but much more importantly, they add so much excitement and drama and historical context, it's worth every gram. To a huge part, that's what these cars are about. It's not just the last tenth of a second of the Nordschleife. These dream cars need to tell a story. That's why people remember them, even 60 years later. And these gullwing doors have a huge share in that story. So thanks AMG for the efforts and the courage. And in case you didn't like gullwing doors as much as I do, there was an alternative for you among the many SLS variants that were about to be introduced in the years to come. So the SLS Coupe, as it was introduced at the end of 2009, was built until June 2014 without a major facelift. But during its life cycle, many different variants and derivatives of the car were introduced. And I'd like to give you a brief overview of the SLS portfolio. Each of these cars would be enough for an own episode, so I'm really just scratching the surface here. The first variant is a bit of a special case, because it was not for sale, obviously, but I still want to mention it. It's the official Formula One safety car. With the 2010 season, the brand new SLS immediately took over from the SL63. In the long line of Mercedes safety cars since 1996, the SLS was my personal favorite and also the longest serving one. It was in duty for four years and led the Formula One grid for a total of 253 laps. That's a lot. 
Eddie Irvine and Giancarlo Fisichella didn't get close to that number, and they were racing in F1 for 10 and 14 years. Let's have a look at one of the greatest moments. Vediamo, vediamo Irvine in lotta con Fisichella, proprio all'ultima curva si toccano e vanno in testa coda. Testa coda. Fisichella ha tentato la Ecco, vanno, vanno a spiegarsi Fisichella e Irvine e mi sembra che Fisichella sia abbastanza alterato. That's what safety cars are here for. The next SLS had no solid roof and therefore lost its gullwing doors. It's the 2011 SLS Roadster. This came two years after the launch of the Coupe and as you would expect, there's no big surprise here in terms of concept. It carries over all the chassis and powertrain from the C197, also largely the cockpit and interior. New are these very ordinary doors and obviously the fabric roof. It's a very light and compact design, opens in only 11 seconds and up to 50 km per hour. You could get it in black, beige or Milan red and thus add a bit of extra color on top of your SLS. The starting price for the Roadster was 195,000 euros in Germany, which is a hefty 18k above the coupe. And no more gullwing doors. Well, but then you could do this. <laughs> Three F1 world titles in this car, so they should know what is good. The next car in line would also sit well on these guys and Mika actually raced it. It's the SLS GT3. This very special variant of the SLS was introduced in 2011 for the AMG customer racing program and designed in compliance with the FIA GT3 regulations. Private teams could order that gorgeous gullwing race car for only 397,000 euros to run it in sprint and endurance races between 2011 and 2015. The decision to derive a GT3 variant from the SNS was already made during the development of the road car. It clearly underscores AMG's claim that the SNS is a serious sports car and gives the chance to compete on the racetrack against top class competition like Porsche 911, RDR8, Ferrari 458, Lamborghini Gallardo and others. A first concept was shown in 2010 to tease racing teams worldwide. The GT3 was developed and built in cooperation with HWA in a Falterbach. It carries over large parts of the SLS body and the transaxle powertrain layout. The engine is basically the same 6.2 litre V8 that's required by the regulations and the transmission is a six-speed sequential racing gearbox. On the exterior side the car has all kinds of adaptations to make it fit for racing, like bigger air intakes and outlets, louvers on the front fenders, wider wheel arches for the increased track, a flat underfloor and on the rear a huge diffuser plus wing. The exhaust exits behind the front wheels. That's a touch of SLR on your SLS. What else? Of course, adjustable springs and dampers and a roll cage. That's more or less it. In total, somewhere around 100 SLS GT3 were built, each about 300 kilograms lighter than the standard SLS. And they were very successful GT3 cars that have won many, many races. The highlight was certainly the victory of the Black Falcon team at the 24 hour race at the Nürburgring in 2013. This was the first time ever a Mercedes has won this prestigious race. Well done GT3 and back to road cars. 2012 saw a subtle upgrade of the SLS Coupe and Roadster being called the SLS AMG GT. Not sure what to think of the nomenclature. Can be a bit confusing with the successor GT, but okay, that's not the point here. SLS GT. 205,000 euros, again almost 18k on top of the SLS. The most relevant updates were slightly quicker gear shift reactions and clutch actuation in manual mode, and a slightly more refined chassis with stiffer springs and a new adaptive damping system. Beyond that, you get 20 more horsepower, but still the same torque, same top speed. And there's a few new color and trim options. On the exterior, you get dark and front and rear lights, some black pieces here and there and inside the cabin a few more red stitches and shiny black trim parts. So to sum it up, it's a slightly optimized version, but certainly not a huge step from the standard SLS. That changes totally with the next guy. The Black Series is not only the most extreme SLS, it's also by far the most extreme and radical Black Series model that AMG has ever made by then. This car, I'm sure, took many people and also competitors very much by surprise. It's the fastest, most hardcore AMG ever built high-end supercar territory, a proper track tool very much inspired by the GT3 race car. 
There's plenty of new exciting stuff implemented in the Black Series. Let's have a quick look at the menu, starting with the engine. It's still the M159, but with new air intake geometry, new cam profiles, and it revs much higher, 8,000 RPM, instead of the previous 7,200. 631 horsepower is the output, 60 above the standard SLS. On top of that, you get plenty of weight-saving measures all over the car. The exhaust system is titanium, the torque tube is carbon fiber, the front bonnet is carbon fiber, you get a much lighter lithium-ion battery, the list goes on and on. So it's a few kilos in several corners of the car, and in total we're 70 kg down from the standard SLS. The gearbox is mounted slightly lower in the car to bring down the center of gravity and shifting times are once more quicker than on the SLS GT. And behind the gearbox sits a completely new active variable locking differential. The chassis all around is much stiffer and sharpened for track use. Front and rear track are significantly wider. You get ceramic brakes as standard and sticky Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2 tires on new Black Series specific forged wheels. All that is wrapped in a completely new exterior body kit which we're going to talk about in a minute, as well as a revised interior with bucket seats and lots of Alcantara. That's more or less the Black Series menu for the SLS. Pretty comprehensive and very impressive pieces of tech. And as a result, this car feels totally different than any normal SLS. I'm by no means a professional driver, far from it. But I've driven the SLS and the Black Series on several occasions. And I can tell that this is a completely different ballgame. The word of a race car for the road is no exaggeration for this SLS. It's unbelievable and a milestone in AMG history. To put this into perspective, the SLS Black Series left the Nordschleife in 7 minutes 25 seconds. This is the territory of a Ferrari Enzo, an Aventador LP700, a Carrera GT, a Ghani Zonda. The 2018 Ferrari 812 Superfast is actually slower. Okay, I guess that's enough to get a feeling of what this car can do. It's absolutely mind-boggling and the way it performs is beyond any doubt. But there's something else about the Black Series where I personally have an issue with. And that's the way it looks. I wish it would have looked a bit more like a GT3, which in my opinion is absolutely brilliant. It looks sharp and precise, lightweight and nimble. A very technical design. This of course all comes down to personal taste, so that's just my thoughts. And I know everybody loves the Black Series and I'm very alone with this opinion. But to me, compared with the GT3, the Black Series looks a bit unrefined, bulky, unelegant, and in many ways more like an aftermarket kit than something coming out of the factory. I'm struggling with it since its launch. I really wish it would have looked more like a race car and less like a toy. Tell me what you think. Whatever. Around 350 units were built. Prices in Germany started just short of 300,000 euros, including tax. It's worth much, much more today. So that was a brilliant investment, a brilliant piece of engineering, and one of the all-time legends made by AMG. But it was nowhere near being the most expensive one. In the same year of the Black Series launch, AMG also presented something very different. It was even more powerful, had the price of more than two SLS, was powered by four motors, and more exclusive than a CLK GTO. And compared to all the other SLSs, it was very silent. The SLS electric drive was a very unusual project at AMG, at a time when not many companies were really thinking electric, especially not in the performance segment. I mean, today this is totally normal business. There's a new electric hypercar every month, and they all do 0 to 60 in two seconds. Completely normal. But in 2013, AMG was pretty alone and very much ahead of its time. The batteries were developed by the Mercedes F1 experts at High Performance Powertrain in Brixworth. They knew the technology from the Curse systems they were running in the F1 car since 2009. AMG installed 60 kilowatt hours of battery capacity within a modified body in white. The liquid-cooled battery modules are packaged partly within the center tunnel, in the front engine bay, and in the area of the fuel tank. The whole battery is integrated in a new carbon fiber shell, which is housing and structure at the same time. You have four electric motors in the car, all identical, 138 kilowatt, each driving one wheel, independently from the others. And this is where the true magic begins. That gives us not only the first all-wheel drive SLS, but also a car where you can apply any positive or negative torque 
on each of your four wheels within a split second. That obviously is something that has never existed on any internal combustion engine car ever. And to understand how that feels, I'm handing over to the legend Walter Röhl. And you will get the message, although he's speaking German. And his German is not even proper German. But anyway, let's go. Da lächst mich am Arsch. Beeindruckend. <lacht> Und wie ja, war's? Unglaublich. Also das, das kann man sich gar nicht vorstellen, dass es sowas gibt. Also, das ist unvorstellbar, so habe ich noch nicht erlebt. Also ich, ich, bin, ich war platt, fährst aufs erste Eck hin, längst ein und das fährt da ums Eck rum, dass du sagst, dir bleibt das Hirn stehen, gell? das ist unglaublich. Das war, ich habe gerade gesagt, Gott sei Dank, dass ich sowas noch erleben durfte. Also es ist unglaublich, das ist sehr beeindruckend. The SLS Electric Drive is the kind of car you need to impress a man who's used to driving like this. So this SLS was an absolutely fascinating piece of technology, a laboratory on wheels, and basically a research project that you could go out and buy. However, serious production in that context is a bit exaggerated. These cars were hand-built in extremely low production numbers. A total of nine cars is said to have been sold. The price might have been one issue, almost half a million euros. But as I said, it's a small serious research car that you could purchase. So that price tag was totally justified. Quite recently, one of the few cars was up for sale and the asking price was above 1 million euros. Back to cars for ordinary people. Time for the grand finale. Already in 2014, just five years after the world premiere, the chapter SLS was about to close. And of course, with an icon like that, you don't just build the last car and go home. You do it in style, with a final edition. And it's not just the SLS final edition. It's the SLS AMG GT final edition. Someone at AMG loves this. The edition is limited to 350 units and you can get them as coupe or roadster. Under the hood, this is 100% an SLS GT. No changes on the tech. The main story of the final edition is visible carbon fiber all around, which gives the car a very unique look, contrasting the body color. You have a carbon fiber bonnet, a carbon fiber front splitter and the carbon fiber rear wing borrowed from the Black Series. The forged wheels are exclusive for the final edition, as well as obviously the badge on the center console. The edition was sold out quite quickly, of course. It was the last chance to grab an SLS from factory. Something like that is highly collectible. And that was it. In June 2014, after more than 10,000 cars built, the very final SLS left the factory in Sindelfingen. A pretty memorable moment. The SLS was a remarkable chapter in Mercedes history. An incredibly iconic car, special in every aspect. This was not just a slightly modified SL with some fancy doors. Mercedes and AMG went all in, created a stunning supercar, a piece of art, a legend to succeed the 1954 Gullwing. And I'm actually glad they are not doing this every 10 years. I'm sure other companies would milk this Gullwing story at every occasion putting Galwing doors on whatever. Mercedes obviously resisted that temptation, and that's a good thing. Keep it exclusive, avoid inflation. In my opinion, they should have done one more, just to have one Galwing supercar for each generation. Just one on top, somewhere around 1980. That would have been nice. Well, let's see how long it takes till the next episode of that story comes to life. And until that happens, the SLS remains the last Mercedes supercar. And the last Galwing. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it.